Cohen, and this is congressional report. Congressional report, well, it deals with things that Congressman deals with. And when the basketball team in the NCAA tournament wins, they go to visit the White House. I want to go to the White House. I should have been twice. I haven't been. I'm going to go with Josh Pastor, the new coach of the University of Memphis. Congressman, thank you for having me. When are we going to the White House? When are we going to win that national championship? You know what was funny about it? Uh, somebody told me that I should put on, in the beginning of, this, uh, of the season, one of our slogans should be, we want to see the, we want to see the president. So that means, you know, because if you win the championship, you get to see the, you get to see the president, and that would be our, our focus and our goal. But uh, actually, when I was a freshman at the University of Arizona, we, um, I was a, uh, we had won the national championship, and we got to visit the White House afterwards when, when President Clinton was there and got to meet him and uh, Vice President Gore. So uh, what a wonderful experience that was. But um, that's the whole goal is to win the national championship so we have an opportunity to, to visit the White House. So is, would, that be, would it be accurate? that you would be the only coach the University of Memphis has ever had who has visited the White House as a national champion? I don't know. That's something that we would need to check with our information, sports information, to find out if that's the truth or not on that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure on that. If any of, a, of any of them in the basketball, I don't know if any of the assistant coaches, even in the previous past, ha have done it, um, uh, have visited the White House as a, as a national champion. I but, think uh, you're it. I, think I you're could it. be it. I could be it. But I hope to do it as a coach one day as a, as a head coach. That's what our eventual goal is to, to do. Now, I know there are things you can't talk about because of NCAA rules. Nothing I can't talk about because I have congressional immunity. <laughs> uh, I know you've got to be just absolutely rock and rolling, as you say, yep. Jack, yes, sir. Uh, over having the number 17 recruit in the country, according to Rivals.com, uh, sign a scholarship with the University of Memphis. But he didn't sign a national letter of intent. Tell us the difference and how that inhibits you? Well, the national letter of intent, people sometimes get a little bit caught up on the, on the letter of intent uh, uh, terminology, and I say that because what it is, is in men's basketball, there's, there's two uh, signing periods. One in early, they call it early, which is in the November period for about ten day, seven, to, seven or eight days, and then there's one in the late period, which starts in April and ends at May 20th, which goes a little over a month. And what it means is when you sign a letter of intent, it, it, it binds the, the, the prospective student-athlete to the university, and it binds the university to the prospective student-athlete, and you can publicly talk about the pro prospective student-athlete, and the rules kind of go out the window as in terms of number of calls per week, the way you can contact them, stuff like that. Um, so that's what's a good thing about the letter of intent, but it doesn't mean anything as in terms of so-called that the kid still can make a decision after the letter of intent date, whether it's in end of May, June, July, August, and sign financial aid papers, which would mean that uh, he's, you're bound to the, to the prospect and, um, um, and that he's still coming to your school. It's just more of a, of a public thing that you're not able to, to talk about the prospective student athlete if he doesn't sign a national letter of intent. So after May 20, when can a player sign a national letter of intent? You, you can sign it as long as you sign the national letter of intent on May 20th and it's dated May 20th. You have 21, you can hold on to the letter of intent. You have 20, you can sign 12 of them from 12 different schools. You just can't, it has to be turned into a league office by 21 days after you sign the letter of intent. Can you sign it after May 20? No. So May 20th, is, is, that's the deadline. You can hold on to it. And I've told kids, hey, if you're not sure, sign it, hold on to it. Think about it for two weeks because we don't have to turn it in for 21 days. Think about it. And if you don't want to do it, rip it up, throw it away, or, or, Sign, if you're, if you're not sure, f between four schools, sign four different ones. And then the one that you want, after you take a little more time, send that one in, rip up the other three. So, so just to, for an example, if there was a player on, on May the 26th who signed a, uh, a scholarship with the University of Memphis, uh, would he have a national letter of intent that he has could sent Only in? if he signed, he, yes. If we issued him one letter of intent and he signed it on May 20th, dated May 20th, and then made a decision publicly on the 26th, that could be a... And he then turns the paperwork into the league office, then you would have him as a letter of intent. And he's got 21 days to do that. Turn it in May after 20th. May 20th. Yes. Yeah. And is that something you expect might happen? Well, you know, the, the thing is, is again, we, we in, in just in general, sometimes that uh, uh, people get a little wrapped up in the letter of intent. And it really, in the big picture of things, as you see in this day and age with college athletics, sometimes kids that do sign letter of intents ended up wanting to go to other schools and they end up getting out of it. And so, 
it really just makes it, it you're kind of bound to each other and, you, and, and the school has a little more leverage over the kid more so than if you just sign scholarship papers. If you just sign scholarship papers or financial aid papers, the school doesn't have as much leverage over the prospective student athlete. It's more the, the, the prospect has more leverage over the university. All right, well, we've had a good signing, and that's made people feel good about the future. And, and, and there's been no, to the best of my knowledge, no first-year coach in the University of Memphis's history to sign anybody that highly rated. I think that's also accurate. So those are good things. You're looking for other players, I'm sure. How many players do you think you'll have on scholarship come uh, next, next fall? I want to see if we can petition to the NCAA. Maybe you as, as in Congress can petition to see if we can get 30 scholarships because I want to get as many players as we can get, you know. But we're only allowed per, per year on an on a, on a individual year to have 13, no more than 13. And um, it's just going to be something where we've got to make sure that we're not just signing players just to sign guys. They have to have, I want quality. I want the right type of student athlete in here. He's got to be good enough. He's got to be on a high-level player. And he, I want him to be a high level in everything he does. If he doesn't have that, that fire, that, that fire in his gut to want to be the best at everything that he wants to be at, whether that's on the court, in the classroom, in the community, dealing with people, I don't want him just to be good. I want him to want to be great. I want him to be the very best. And I'm it, with you, but next so, year you need bodies. But we need bodies, but, but if you don't get the right bodies, it ends up affecting you for 2010. 2011, two, it hurts you for later on. It's the big picture, it's the long term. If you're just looking for a quick fix, to pad little thing up here and there, you end up, when there's a little adversity or some tough times, it crumbles under you. You've so got to have a strong base. So the kids that signed with Ole Miss, that signed with Seton Hall, that signed with Missouri, they weren't the kids you wanted. I want, to, I want to recruit inside and out, like I said in my press conference. That's very important to me, that we want to do a job within the city first, because there's so much good talent here with good coaches, both high school and summer league coaches, there's so many good people involved in these kids. But again, the kid's got to be good enough, and he's got to be good enough not only on the floor, but also off the floor as well. That's important to me. And we will do our job to make sure that we evaluate and target those kids as early as possible. And if we feel that they can help this program even extend to a, even a higher level, those are the kids that we want. And we will do our job to make sure that the first part of, of recruiting will be on the inside to make sure we look at the, at the, at the Next local Next year kids. in Memphis, you've got a, uh, a point guard. It's right, ranked 16th in the country. Mm -hmm. You've got three, uh, two guards who are three stars. Uh, got Baylor, Missouri, UAB, Alabama, Tennessee. The, basically, it's the Ole Miss, the same usual suspects mm -hmm. for all those kids. And you got the number five center in the country here. If you get one of those th two guards, get the point guard and get the center, you got a great year. You don't have to leave Shelby County. You can win the national championship with kids from, from this city. You got to get the right kid. When I say the right kid, there's a lot of really good players. I want to get the best. And, I wanna, and that's again, it's not all based on rankings. It's not all based on what they're, because sometimes those rankings mean nothing because you get a kid that's highly ranked. And they, and they get to a university and they just don't pan out. Or a kid that's lower ranked, that's maybe more hungry, they get there and they blossom. It's evaluating, evaluating the right type of, of student what athlete. What type of player do you want? Do you, do, you want do you want six, eight skinny guys that play the dribble drive? Do you want six, four guys that leap? What, what's the perfect player that you look for? I want a winner, a person who knows how to win. I want a person that plays hard, who's tough, who has a motor. That's, that's a, when I say a motor that plays that gives an effort, a maximum effort, every single possession. He plays every possession like it's his last possession to ever play. And that's not, people, pe playing hard and having that type of motor is a skill set. That's a skill set. And you win with guys like that. You win with winners. And I want to make sure that we get guys that are skilled. I, you know, I want high level athletes. I want to play up and down. I want to play fast. I want to attack the rim. But in order to do that, we got to get guys that can, are, are skilled as well too. Is it important to have a player that can make a free throw? It's important to have a player to be able to do everything. And, and, um, do you think you can teach coach kids to make free throws? You can teach them anything you want to do. A lot of it, though, becomes practice. It becomes just practice. And a lot of times in free throw shooting, it becomes more mental than anything. I mean, it's a 15-foot shot. It's, there's nobody in front of you. It's, it's a mental you know, habit forming of what you do in practice on an everyday basis. Well, Memphis used to have good free throw shooters. Uh, Andre Turner, John Wilfong, Larry Finch, they hit them all. Bobby Parks. 
and those are some great players. And let me say this: when you're talking about uh, just with Dwight Boyd, I think Dwight. Well, and and I mean, obviously, I've told pe many people this when you're talking about some of the past players. I've told with recruits, fans, you know, people, supporters of the program, that what Coach Calipari has done here in the last four years of this program is awesome. I mean, it's it's unreal. It's it's really not reality because it's the winningest. You're the winningest program in the history of the NC2A. So uh, it's, it's something that's just, when you, I say wow, it's, it's a wow factor. But, all, but on top of that though, there's been many other great coaches here even before Coach Calipari as well too. I mean, you've had Coach Finch, Coach Kirk, Coach Barta with many great teams and great players too. And um, I, I think if you just not only include those four years, the last four years, but the tradition that has been set here for such a long period of time, I think sometimes that's sometimes overlooked as well too because there's so many good teams and good coaches and good players that have been here for a long, way before than I've been here, Coach Cal, any of us have been here. You're a great recruiter. What does a great recruiter do to find players? Do you read Rivals.com? Do you read all those blog sites? Do you have your own special uh, uh, skimmies that people send you that you can subscribe to? Is there some coach's manual? Relationships. People, you know, recruiting is about relationships, so you, you get word of mouth. You. Uh, do your homework, making sure that you leave no stone unturned. Every I is dotted, every T is crossed. Relationships, and when you when you do, when you target a kid, you know that he's good enough. Then it becomes on honesty and trust. That's the bottom line. What it comes on to, because you, 95 percent of the time, when a kid chooses a school, it comes down to the the head coach, style of play. That's what it comes down to. Because a lot of times, when they're making their deciding factors, when you throw in after all the academics, after the community after everything that goes into it, they're, they're what may, separates maybe a kid choosing a school or not becomes from the head coach. When I say the head coach, the relationship that he has with that head coach and the style of play because kids like to play a certain style of play. See, I learned something. I thought it was barbecue. <laughs> that, has, that has a little, hey, every person that's come here on campus has said that the, the, the food here is just unbelievable. They said uh, they would make sure they'd have to exercise if they come here to Memphis. Pierre. Pierre, let, let me say this on Pierre. Uh, we're counting on Pierre. We need Pierre. We're going to be very positive with Pierre because he's a guy that has, a, has an opportunity to do really good things for us. Um, Pierre, I've told Pierre face to face, I want him to be the very best conditioned student athlete that he can be. Production equals playing time. I'm a black and white guy. There's no gray area. If you produce, you play. If you don't produce, you don't play. If you produce and you produce at a high level, I'll play all 40 minutes. If you don't produce, you're sitting. It's just that simple. But I said, Pierre, you've got to be able to be in a condition where you can sustain it for long periods of time. And if you have to do what you need to do, you have to be self-motivated, disciplined to be wanting to do it. I can't want it for you more than you want it. Somebody else can't want it for you more than you want it. It's got to come from you. For, again, that winner mentality that not, I don't want to be good. I want to be great. I want to be the best. And Congressman, as you know this, because you deal at the highest level of people in, in all fields, there's such a thin line between goodness and greatness. And there's a lot of people hanging around, you know, but it takes, it takes that extra sacrifice, that extra desire, dedication, discipline to get on that great side. And um, that's why the people who are at the elite of their professions in, in anything that it is, they just have that ability to, to cross that line to do what they need to do. Different players respond to different motivations. Yes. Some tough love, some a little different love. What kind of loves Willie Kemp can respond to? What kind of loves are you going to get? Congressman, there's two ways to, to uh, there's two things on, on leadership. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, being a head coach, you have to manage. You're managing. Uh, managing, you manage money. You manage your things. You manage your investments. You manage your bills, whatever. I want to lead. And I've told people, we, we, me as a head coach, it's my responsibility to be a leader. And what's a, what's a leader? There's two ways to be a leader. You can either... Uh, uh, use leadership as power, and what's power? Power is saying, okay, if you don't do this, then there's a, then you're, this is what's going to happen, and you force them to do something. Or you have leadership by authority. What's authority? Authority is that they want to do it out of respect, and they were willing to go through a wall for you because, in return, you're as authority, you're serving them as a leader, and that's something that we want as our coaching staff, as our players. We want everyone involved to have authority, not just power, and that's something I've told Willie. He, uh, we're going to count on him to be a leader. We, we are really, really counting on him. We know he's going to do great things next year for us. 
but he's got to lead himself before anything. And when I say lead himself, he's got to get himself up. He's got a new lease on basketball life. He's got to get positive, be positive about himself, get his confidence back, have, have the ability to, to go into a gym knowing that he's the best on the floor, and he's got to work at it. So we've had many talks on that. We're counting on Willie, and I th I'm expecting good things for, for Willie next season. Let me ask you, you say relationships, and I know you get probably you get calls from this one or calls from that one. Uh, there was a guy a couple of months ago who announced he was leaving the University of Arizona. I imagine you had something to do with recruiting him. You were there at the time. Um, when, A, is that kid, has he signed with anybody or is he still out there? Um, we, I don't know which exactly. We, the guard, he played, started a third of the game. Yeah, you're, yeah you're, uh, I know who you're talking about. He, he's, he's, he, uh, the kid you're, you're mentioning, uh, we, are not, we will not recruit him. Okay. Yes. When, when kids transfer, and I see them on Rivals.com, so-and-so going to Ohio U, so-and-so going to wherever, how do you find out about that? Is there, do you check something every day to go, who's transferring? Is there, is there a list? How do you find out? Because of the Internet age, just things happen. If just everything gets caught on the Internet now, and you, word of mouth, the, the profession such an inner circle. There's many people that are very close. It's just something that... Uh, uh, you just find out, you know, you hear, and you just go from there. You've got great assistance. That's why I've hired a, a tremendous staff, which I believe, and you're able to uh, uh, get, gather information, and, and you go from there. You've hired Cyprian and the gentleman from, from Rice. Willis Wilson. Willis Wilson. He's got a lot of experience. And then have you hired the, the, is it Murphy from the Bronx? Jack, Jack Murphy from the Denver Nuggets. We've got to officially wait till they're done before we can move forward with that. Kobe's trying to help you. Kobe's trying to help me. I'm a little, I'm a little, I've, I've actually talked to Jack Murphy about it. I'm a little disappointed in Kobe that he hasn't done more for us to, by, you know, you, he is the best player probably in the, in the world today, so. What does Murphy bring to the program? Is he the guy that they can say, well, he's seen the NBA and he can help you get, get there? He, he's, he's, he's been in the NBA. Um, he's been around those guys. He does a lot of the individual workouts. He's, he does a lot of the advanced scouting as well. Um, he just brings a lot of the flair to the NBA. But let me, let me say this, people get a little, confused about basketball they make it a point that uh, you think that uh, you're, you're dealing with NASA you're dealing with science you're dealing with government stuff this is basketball it is very it's a simple game it's about basics it's about being fundamentally sound it's about playing good solid basketball sometimes people think being a basketball coach takes a gene it doesn't it's about leading people putting them in positions to, to succeed having the players believe and as a unit that they're, and they're going to willing to go through a wall for you and then you're being really sound at the basics it's it's really it's a simple thing sometimes we overcomplicate stuff and and that's what paralysis through analysis is what I like to say dribble drive do we have dribble drive or do we have the the, the Josh dribble drive uh, I, I will probably there's so many good things about the dribble drive and I love the dribble drive offense and coach Calipari what he's done with it the last four years here is is you know that's like we talked about that speaks for itself, but I've got to make sure the offense that we that we do is what's best for our personnel. I don't think next season the dribble drive will be the best for based on our personnel. We will do some other things, maybe more of a motion oriented game. But I can tell you this: we will play fast. I want to play up tempo. I want to score points because kids like playing that way. Recruits like playing that way. I will probably take some things incorporated from from uh, Lute Olson at the University of Arizona as in terms of his motion offense and then stuff from Coach Calipari and his dribble drive and put it together and go from there. I've read that you're looking at recruiting strongly in Texas, maybe Arizona. Texas got a lot of kids. I read about a kid in the 2010 class. I think he's 17th power forward, and he went to Bass, AAU. Doesn't hurt if you had a kid from Bass AAU come to Memphis, would it? You're, that's amazing. You're, the information that you have, you're on top of it. I tell you what. Um, I should, in case the election doesn't go right, I'm available. Um, yeah, and I have a couple staff spots, so give me, <laughs> give me, give me a shout. Um, but uh, recruiting is we're going to do wherever there's a, where there's a player that's good enough, we're going to go recruit him. Now, we've got to make sure that we're, we work hard but efficient and smart, not just wild and reckless. It's got to be hard work, but it, that's efficient and smart. Now you've been put in a tough spot. Not only are you kind of, you're following a, a legend who's had this m unbelievable number one record in NCAA history, a you get, Will Coleman sticks with you. You got to start from scratch on your recruiting for this year. You're still working on this year's recruiting. You hadn't been able to do much on 2010. Looking at those same sites, almost half the top players for 2010 have already committed. Mm -hmm. None of them committed to Kentucky either. So Cal, in closing up his shop, hadn't had to work on 2010 mm -hmm. yet. Uh, you'll catch up. But 2010, you've got you to be working on that as well as 2009 now. We need to be working on 2010, 11, 12, 13, and I mean that. I mean, um, I've, I, heck, 
I've sent a letter to a kid that was, I knew was going to be a seven-footer when I found out was going to, the gender was going to be male. I sent a letter to him when he was in his womb. And so it's, there is never too early to start recruiting. And the lifeline of every, any program is recruiting. But again, you just can't take, you, it's got, there's patience because there's going to be peaks and valleys. You've got to stay even keeled. You can't get too high with the highs, too lows with the lows. It's quality. It's proper evaluation. And we just got to do it. There's, we, there's plenty of good players out there. And it's just us, our job to evaluate, to find, to target, and then get them here. Cal went to China. Are you going to go outside the country? Is there a chance you might go to uh, Israel, France, Russia? There's things that I'm, that I'm looking at for sure. Uh, I probably won't do anything this, this off season, obviously, just because I got so much to do here, just here with locally and, and within the states. But uh, that's something to look, that to look for in the future. Africa was a big recruiting spot for a lot of coaches, which Memphis never really got into. Cal got a few centers. None of them developed. Well, I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the game has become globally now, and there's so many good players all, all around the country. But, uh, again, there's a lot of good players within the states as well, too. So you just got to make sure that, again, it comes back to contacts. When you were talking about recruiting earlier, with, um, with, with recruiting, it's, it's contacts, someone giving you a heads up if there's a kid in a, in, a, in a foreign country that they say, hey, this kid is really good, make it on a plane and go watch him. Scheduling. You, uh, so I read in the paper you're looking at Texas and Arizona. So you want to play schools in Texas, not that we don't have UTEP, SMU, Rice, and Houston. Uh, what are you looking at? Um, it's important for us at the high, to remain in this program at the highest level that we play a great non-conference schedule. I want to get on TV as much as we can. We'll play anyone, anywhere, anytime. But we've got to make sure that we get the right players in and we got to be able to do that. Uh, I would like to play in different areas where we have a chance to make a difference in recruiting as well, too. Or if we get a certain kid from a certain area, maybe bring him back home and, and play a game like that. So great thing about the league, the Conference USA, is you're, you're, you're really spread out that you can play in different areas where if you get a kid or two from that area, they, their, their families and, and um, uh, their people can come watch and play. Cal liked to bring back his, at least last year he did, his former coaches. Mass came in here and, and what was the school? Was it Siena or somebody in It was uh, UMass and Marist. Lamar, you know, obviously with Tony Barbie at UTEP. Other than Barbie, who you'll play on the schedule, there's no good reason to bring Massachusetts down here. All he's going to do is recruit against you. Yeah, we, we won't play. This will be the final year that we'll play UMass. We're actually at UMass in the Boston Garden, and Derek Kellogg's a good friend of mine who's, yeah. who's going to do a really good job at UMass. They're going to be really good next year. I mean, that's going to be a tough game. And uh, But, yeah, I, there's no need to continue that series because of the fact that uh, um, um, you know, that was more brought back for, uh, for the Coach Calipari, Coach Kellogg, um, you know, head coach, assistant coach, went to take a program coming back, so it was more on that. So you want to go out to Arizona, and I guess it would probably, if, if you did that, the series would be Arizona, not Arizona State, and in Texas, would you be looking at uh, who, Longhorns? Yeah, well, the Arizona thing is, that's some people from both parties thought it might be kind of cool uh, going back to Arizona, but for me, I'm just like, if that's not what's best for Memphis, then I don't want to do it. I want to do what's best for the University of Memphis. I'm not worried what's best for me, what's best for the University of Memphis. And, and again, that comes back to leadership. You all want to serve others before, to be able to serve others, that helps you in, in, in everything else because that comes back to authority, not power. And, um, but on Texas, though, the, uh, it, it would, if we were going to play a team in Texas, probably be the University of Texas. Texas has got a lot of talent. Does Arizona Tons. have that much talent? Uh, they're, they're, they're getting better there. They're getting better. Mostly they got old people playing golf, I thought. They got a lot of, a lot of golfers over there, but they do have some good talent in some different areas, and especially in the Phoenix area where that's growing. Do you have any thoughts about JC players vis-a-vis -vis, uh, high school players? If, if, they are, if you're good enough and you're a good enough student athlete and you fit what we were looking for, we'll, we'll go recruit you and bring you here. What about one and dones? I mean, sure, Derek Rose, nobody could ever question him, and, and Tyreek was phenomenal. But sometimes, if you, is, there, is there a problem with too many one and dones? No, I mean, I hope we, every guy that wants to come here, if we have a chance to, to help them get, reach their goals, which I would expect that their individual goals should want to play in the NBA, if that's what their drive and motivation as an individual goal, we want to help them get there do, to do that, whether that's one year, two years, three years, four years. But you also got to have a good mix. You can't have nine guys who are one and done because that's not, you're not, you're not going to be good as a team. One, and then when they all leave, in, in that one year, you're not going to have uh, a team for next year. So you've got to have a good mix. But if you have a couple guys every year that can go one and done, if they have that opportunity, there's nothing wrong with that. Cal did good with them. I think people question. Cal did great. He did great with them. Sean Banks was the only one that didn't do too good. Yeah, well, and, and, and I'm, I'm a big Coach Calipari fan. I mean, you know, obviously, um, as in terms of my loyalty to him. But, uh, um, but, you know, that helps. I mean, he'll be the first to admit 
as will I, as will Bill Self from Kansas, or Rick Barnes from Texas, or Billy Donovan from Florida. To win, it comes down to players. Got to have great players and um, guys that know how to play. What about nationally televised games? Cal got a lot of those. Uh, Memphis has got a reputation. Can you pull the same thing off? We will do the best we can to pull, pull the same thing off. Obviously, uh, um, when you win, they want you on TV. So it's our job to win. Cal had this thing with John Chaney, and so the, the Temple game was a thing. Do you have any pl coaches out there that want to choke your throat that you can get a game with? Um, I, I've, I keep pretty good with the, most of the coaches. I'm sure some guys don't, you know, in this business, as you know, in your profession, there's guys, you know, maybe you, you respect each other, but they just, you don't have... There's no instant rivalry out there that I, CBS I don't, wants to put on. I don't think there's anything, you know, instant right now. Maybe over time as that develops, we'll see. But, maybe um, UT, maybe Pearl. Who knows, maybe on one of those. But I, I, again, our focus, and I've told our staff, our focus is the University of Memphis. And um, uh, we, we can control what we can control, and that's our preparation. And if we focus on that, we can't worry about external things and, uh, or other programs or other teams or other coaches. We just got to do what's best for us. How much of the schedule is set for next year? Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty set. We're still waiting on a couple games, a couple TV times, and little things like that. So we're just kind of going from there. We used to play Vanderbilt on occasion, and fans liked that. Uh, fans liked Ole Miss. They liked Arkansas. You can only do so much. It, it, do you have any thoughts about doing that, or does that hurt to have Ole Miss come in here? Uh, Still thinking about stuff. I'm not going to make a determination either way. That's we, that would be with discussions with myself and R.C. Johnson, the athletic director, to really determine what's best for the schedule. Yeah, Nolan Richardson stole a lot of good players out of here. Ron Heary, Todd Day. It's a lot of good, there's a lot of really really good players here at the, in in this city and surrounding area. It's you can win a national championship with the with the kids in this city and the surrounding area. Now, if I remember correctly, one of the charities or, or areas that you really have a lot of. Uh, uh, concern about is law enforcement. Is that or not charity, but public areas? Um, I'm, I'm a big time law enforcement fan, uh, supporter, uh, big time military fan and supporter. I was on in the, um, when I was in Arizona, I was heavily involved in the Naval Special Warfare Foundation for uh, uh, wives who've lost their uh, husbands in the line of duty, Navy SEALs and different things like that. So um, uh, I'm big in people who, you know, I, I've told this many times, you know, people have talked to me saying, man, the pressure you have following Coach Cal, I said, the pressure? I said, let me tell you what pressure is. Pressure is being in the military and putting their life on the line for our freedom and protection, being a law enforcement, uh, you know, again, for our freedom and protection. An ATF or DEA going undercover and it, trying to infiltrate a group or a gang to, to, to bring bad guys to jail. Uh, is pressure. A doctor trying to save somebody's life in a matter of minutes is pressure. A firefighter, you know, so that's pressure. What we are dealing with is more uh, industry pressure and it's more of an entertainment for everybody. So let's make sure we keep it in perspective. That's a good way to close it and, and, and because I'm about to go to a school and speak and that's what I tell the kids that while Kobe Bryant, and I love sports as much as anybody else, the real heroes are the policemen and the firemen and the teachers. Let me tell you something, I'd rather get, if I had a choice to get an autograph between Kobe Bryant and LeBron James or a Navy SEAL, I would take the Navy SEAL any day of the week. Josh Pastner, you, you're going to be a good leader in our community. Look forward to watching you and the Tigers and going to the White House with Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate it very much. I'm Steve Cohen. This has been Congressional Report with New Memphis coach John Pastner. Josh Pastner, we're on the way to the White <laughs> House. Thank you very much.